Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We're so glad to welcome you as part of our community tonight. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and distributed live stream. By entering this virtual meeting room, you give your consent to be recorded and distributed by Simeon Morrow Public Speaking and Presentations, Vienna Live with Simeon Morrow, and other third parties. If you prefer not to be recorded, please turn off your camera and or microphone and or go to the Facebook, the LinkedIn Live video feed, the link to which I'll now place in the chat room. For a better experience, please turn off your microphone and set your video to gallery view. This show thrives on participant contributions, and all participants are encouraged to actively participate in this webinar by asking questions and making comments. To do so, please either write in the chat room, raise your hand, or turn on your microphone to say hi, and I will be delighted to include your perspective in the conversation. Tonight, our featured guests are Minette Norman and Dr. Caroline Helbig, two leadership consultants. Minette is a former tech executive who spent three decades in the Silicon Valley software industry and joins us from the San Francisco Bay Area. Caroline has a PhD in human genetics and worked as a consultant at McKinsey and joins us from Bonn, Germany. Minette and Caroline are co-authors of the Psychological Safety Playbook, Lead More Powerfully by Being More Human, which is forthcoming. Minette, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having us. So, Minette, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and why you became a leadership consultant? Yes. Well, as you said, I spent three decades in the software industry. I started out back in 1989 as a technical writer, and I ended up back in 2019 leaving after three decades. And my last job, I was VP of engineering at a large Bay Area software company. And in that job, I was in charge of really transforming how we developed software. And I, I spent five years in that job. And as I was trying to influence change in the organization, a lot of it was technical. It was about tools and technology. But I realized that what was more important than changing tools and changing technology was really about changing behavior and changing culture. And I realized, first of all, how hard that is. And I got myself a big education in really in, in human psychology and as much neuroscience as I could read about to understand how people collaborated and what keeps people from collaborating. And I was also very interested in diversity, equity, and inclusion, being a woman in the tech industry and being very much in the mind. And I often felt I didn't have a voice. And I decided ultimately after those 30 years and five years in that job that I wanted to help other leaders do better, to be more inclusive, to create the conditions where everyone could do their best work. And so I struck out on my own really at the beginning of the pandemic in 2020 as a leadership consultant. And, and here we are today. Fantastic. Caroline, welcome. Thank you, Ms. Simeon, and thank you for having me, and thanks for the invitation. It's great to be here together with Minette. So, Caroline, tell us a little bit about yourself and tell us why you became a leadership consultant. Yeah, I um, had a little bit a different kind of path uh, into uh, leadership consultancy. Um, because my dream already as a little girl was to become a scientist. And that was actually what I did. So um, I, have, um, I um, have a PhD in human genetics. I, um, my training is in human biology. And um, that was really a fantastic experience. However, after four years in research, I thought, oh my goodness, do I really want to concentrate on one little piece forever in my life? Because research is very segmented um, and you are just analyzing one little detailed um, um, piece of the whole play. <laughs> um, and then that was the point I decided, oh, I really want to go broad again and I really want to change track again and um, after my PhD joined um, McKinsey, top management consultancy, something which never crossed my mind before. Um, different than maybe with some um, economic students. Um, I planned to stay for maybe the typical two years or something. However, I stayed much longer because I really enjoyed it. This was a little bit to my own surprise, but 
I found it not so different um, from science because as in science, you have complex problems, problem, um, complex challenges, and you really need to understand um, deep, deep <laughs> um, issues and situations and different stakeholders and so on. And this was something I felt completely prepared to do with my um, training in science. So I stayed much longer. However, then with the growing family, um, a little bit my life changed and also my interest because I kind of moved away from the interest in analytical problems and um, shifted towards more the human side. At, at some point, I really decided I want to focus my work on the human side of leadership because also clients started to reach out to me discussing topics which didn't uh, weren't related to the analytical um, challenges, but more to how do I really lead? How can I also um, grow personally as a leader? And at that point in time, I decided to start out as a self-employed independent um, leadership consultant. And then folk, uh, topics evolved. I um, uh, had this topic, um, psychological safety and so on. Yeah, things evolved. Oh. How inspiring. Uh, so, uh, Minette, I mean, listening to you and to Caroline, changing your career trajectories completely. I mean, moving from what you know, from any kind of what I would say safety, a job safety, moving into completely different fields. And when already you've become established in your, I mean, you would be senior, senior managers or vice presidents or presidents. So tell us, Minette, then about meeting Caroline and, and uh, how how did that happen now? Mar Minette, you're on one side of the world on the Pacific Ocean and then Caroline is there pretty much next to the North Sea in Bonn. I mean, you, you touch one side of the globe and you touch the other, that's pretty much where you two are. So tell us how you met and how this, uh, the, your two stories came together. It's a, it's a pretty wonderful story, and it really involves technology that we're using today, Zoom. We, we met on Zoom. We met in a class that we both signed up for. The class was put on by an organization called the Fearless Organization. The class was for us to get certified in running psychological safety assessments. So as Colleen just said, we she used psychological safety as part of her work in leadership. I did too. I had been very interested in the topic for many years. There is a lot of research, a lot of academic research on psychological safety. And we were both hoping to go beyond the research and learn practical skills on how can we help leaders that we work with increase psychological safety in their teams. And that's why we signed up for this class. Now, I should say, first of all, we, we need to define what psychological safety is because not everyone knows this term. It sounds a little bit geeky and academic. But what psychological safety is, is something that probably everyone has experienced in their lifetimes. And that is that when you are part of a group, it can be any group, it can be in a professional setting, in a volunteer setting, a team setting, basically in this group, you as an individual feel that you have a voice, that your voice is respected, that you can speak up, you can challenge things, you can ask questions, you can even make mistakes. And you know that you're not going to be excluded or ostracized or embarrassed or humiliated. That's essentially it's what psychological safety is. So there we were in this class. There were probably about 25 people in the class. And then the class was divided up into smaller groups. So in our little cohort, Kaolin and I were in the same cohort. And we had met a few times uh, in our sessions. And then one day I was invited to be on a podcast by one of the other students. He had a leadership podcast and I was on the podcast. And I think we, we advertised it to the rest of the class and said, hey, Manette's going to be on Rob's podcast. And then I'm going to let Kaholine pick up the story from here. Kaholine, you're on mute. I, I love to uh, remember <laughs> how we met in class and um, you mentioning this podcast and honestly, <laughs> I never listen to podcasts. I'm really not the audio person. <laughs> um, I really, I'm a book lover and I'm really much better in 
in reading and writing. However, Minette mentioned this podcast and I really remember like it was yesterday. Um, I listened to the podcast in the kitchen while preparing dinner for my family. <laughs> I have a um, big family with um, four kids. However, at that night, I couldn't really um, make progress with my cooking because I always um, had to take notes <laughs> um, of all the interesting stuff Minette was sharing. And um, I immediately thought, oh, wonderful. This is so, so relevant. And obviously Minette is ex um, thinking exactly, exactly as I am because as Minette shared, there is this concept, um, there's a lot of research about the why and the what about psychological safety. However, we as leadership consultants, we need to translate this into practice. We need to advise leaders how to really do it in their busy everyday life. Huh? And there is a gap missing. And while I was cooking or trying to cook, <laughs> Minette shared so many kind of um, uh, tools or um, uh, advices, concrete actionable advice. And I thought, wow, this is exactly the way I'm thinking about psychological safety and exactly the point where I am and where I need to develop kind of um, tangible advice for my clients. And this made me reach out to her with an email. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna pick up the story now. It was June 2nd last year in California. I think she actually sent it on June 1st in Bonn. And in my inbox, first thing in the morning is an email with the subject line, crazy idea. And I loved it. I mean, I just had to open an email that said crazy idea. And in it, Kahaleen wrote that she had listened to the podcast and that she had found so many points in common that we both had and that what I was talking about really resonated. She also mentioned hearing me say I wanted to write a book because I had been thinking about a totally different book, which I later wrote, but uh, I mentioned it on the podcast. I said, I wanted to write a book on inclusive leadership. So she said, I noticed you said you wanted to write a book. I have a crazy idea. You mentioned there's no practical information about how leaders can increase psychological safety in teams. What if you and I collaborated on a little booklet and it would be practical tips? And so I immediately wrote back, yes. I don't remember exactly what I said, but what a great idea. Let's have a Zoom meeting. And from there, we set up a Zoom call and this, is, this has been our division of labor for the whole collaboration. I send the meeting invitation with the Zoom link. Kaholin set up a Miro board. So if people don't know Miro, it's an online whiteboard, which lets you collaborate in ways you might do physically in a room. So we use post-it notes, we use stickies, we do all sorts of collaboration on this Miro board. So in our first conversation, I think Kaholin had already set up that board and we have been using it since June 2021 until today. And I think Caroline's going to do a little screen share to show how this board has evolved from that first crazy idea conversation. Yeah, and go. actually until, until today, the board is called crazy idea. <laughs> so <laughs> when, when I have a meeting with Minette, I open my Miro board, my Miro account and um, go into a crazy idea. And we started, as Minette shared, here on the um, June last year. And actually our first brainstorming was what would be the minimum viable product? So really a booklet. And out of that, you can imagine you can scroll um, and see every every uh, little piece you see here is really a whole session brainstorming a bunch of ideas and out of this grew our our book the structure for our book all the, all the content basically later we for writing we switched to, to um, a text document however all the brainstorming all the creative work is done here on the miro board and now we are here, Simeon's Vienna Show. <laughs> Fantastic. And uh, so, Minette, that was a, a new a new concept to you, this, this Miro board. I've never heard of it. 
it seems like a wonderful way of rather than sending someone a document saying we talked about this it seems like a graphic way that you can you can almost touch it you want to go and look and say oh what's down there what's what's that yeah, it wasn't a totally new concept to me. I had used another program called Mural. So there are other programs like this. There's Miro, there's Mural, there's Jamboard. So they're they're all the same kind of concepts, but I was not very fluent in using them. And I I really just focus on the words and Caroline's really good at visual uh, visuals. And that's like one of her superpowers. And so I kind of learned through her how powerful it can be to use a, a collaboration environment like that, where every idea we've ever had together is captured. And often we end up going back to things we talked about even last year, like what was that we wanted to do here? And I remember we talked about marketing here and we have it all recorded. And I think it's just, it's something I'm gonna use going forward for everything because it's it's been so useful and so helpful for us. Fantastic, let's get into it. Yeah, Simeon, may, may, may I add one remark? <laughs> As a, as a biologist, it's just amazing. The Miro board is basically an infinite whiteboard, right? However, it works so much better than, for example, a structured um, collection of documents or something. And the reason for that is humans are really made for orienting in space. So it's easy for us to find our way. And the whole Miro board is kind of a an environment and we can navigate and we I can exactly pin down where it was where we brainstormed about XYZ. And it's but much better because it fits to our human nature much better. <clears throat> Lovely. I just a remark just, as a biologist. I, I love it. I was just thinking the same thing. It's a geographic way of 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 of, of seeing something so that I could even imagine now I okay Vienna Vienna Live is to the 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 down or i don't know what that would be the the northwest or something or northeast uh so um great so i wanted to get into the book now so minette can you tell us about um an introduction give us a little introduction to this book you talked about psychological safety again you and caroline seem to be very very strong people strong-minded uh, you clearly don't have very many problems speaking your opinions tell us about this why you uh, tell us about the book now and about uh, open op about the opening chapters where you kind of describe these scenes of people in a boardroom or in a meeting and one person is either um, saying something that really kind of shocks everyone or kind of makes creates a situation which people would really kind of go into their shells or other ways where somebody would open up and open up the discussion to include everybody and really make that feeling of everybody is working together, that sense of kind of familiarity, of friendship, of feeling, yes, I'm welcome here. So tell us a little bit about this and then please go take us, uh, I know that we have a special treat because you're going to do a, a mini workshop with us. Yeah, so so the way the book came to be is that, um, as, as Caroline said, we brainstormed like crazy and we ended up coming up with 25 ideas and it's not meant to be like the exhaustive, everything you could possibly do to increase psychological safety, but instead, what are, what are some very tangible ways that you can make changes immediately, like when you go to your next meeting or have your next conversation. So we included 25 different ideas and we divide it, we have five plays and each play has five moves. Now, as you just mentioned, Simeon, and Simeon, thank you for being an early reader. You got an advanced, an advanced reader copy. We included stories in each of the five plays. Each play has a story. They're from either our own professional lives being employees or from our clients' experience. And we know that humans respond to stories because this is what we understand. This is our shared humanity. And so we share stories about things like when someone shuts down your idea in a meeting or actually says, you know, the, one of the stories that I shared was um, one of my colleagues being told by another colleague, we should eliminate your whole team. And, and, you know, what that feels like and how one might react to a situation like that. Colleen has stories about 
some of her colleagues and how one of them was was so inclusive in a way that they had she had never seen before inviting the whole team that worked on something to present to a very very important public figure when in the past it would only be the leader who went and how different that felt so we share these kinds of stories as sort of an entree for people to understand the power of when there is psychological safety and the absence of it and what happens. So that's the idea about the book. Um, the book is coming out in February. So this is actually our first experiment and we're, we're so happy to be here with all of you. Oh, thank you. Yes, yeah, so here's our website. Um, we just launched the website, by the way, the psychologicalsafetyplaybook.com. And if you wanna sign up, you can sign up to get updates. We're gonna be releasing preview content and some special offers as we get closer to the publication date in February. So thanks for that, Simeon. What we thought we could do today uh, for, for you who are here is we're gonna run just a really mini, like a mini workshop, you know, maybe 30 minutes that we'll, we'll spend. And what we thought we would do is we're going to do, and I wouldn't say a deep dive because a deep dive could take all day. We could go all day into one of the moves, but we're going to do a mini dive into three of the moves. And we hope you'll all play with us. This is all, you know, we want your participation. This is not just us. We want to learn from all of you too. So the way we're going to start this off, we're going to kick it off is that Simeon's going to put up a poll, just one question to start with. And if you could all respond how do you feel about this statement? I often avoid admitting that I don't know something. There's no right answer, there's no wrong answer, but please, please decide how you feel about that. I often avoid admitting that I don't know something. Okay, is that the that's the full results of our poll? Or are we are we still getting answers? It looks like we have a hundred percent disagree with that. Okay. Simi, do we want to take down the poll or share the results? I guess we share. Is that working? So this is yeah, so that's working. Hundred percent so disagree with the statement, I often avoid admitting that I don't know something. <laughs> so. Okay, good. We don't have a, we don't have a lot of responses here. So, okay. Um, now, what does that mean? I think that's really interesting because it's very common, very, very common, especially people who are in positions of leadership management to feel that, um, you know, I, I, I can't, I can't actually, share when I don't know something uh, that I, I can't admit when I don't know something. So one of the one of the things that we start off with early in our book is the idea that if you are in a leadership position, it's really important that you let everyone around you know that you are not perfect and you don't know everything. So even if you present an idea, like you may say, this is our strategy for the quarter and for the year. And we've done a lot of thinking about this and this is what we're presenting. And this is what you're all gonna have to get behind. What's very powerful is to then say, what am I missing? What have I not thought of? Because what you're doing when you can invite other people's ideas is that you're saying, I am not omniscient and I am open to different perspectives. So when you are in a leadership position, it's really easy for you to shut down other people's ideas. It can, you can do it inadvertently, but when you say, what am I missing? And Caroline's illustrating this as she does in our book, you're saying, I am open to your perspective I am even open to being challenged. And it, I am creating a safe space for you to speak up and say, you know, I, I understand what you're saying, but I'm seeing it from a different angle. Have you ever thought about this? And then it's very important for you to, to thank someone who does challenge you and say, gosh, thank you. I, I really hadn't thought of that. I did miss that. We need to, we need to consider this point of view. So that is such a powerful, vulnerable thing for a leader to do, to be able to say, what am I missing? 
you know, you can do this in your personal life too. This is, you know, when you're getting into uh, a discussion with someone and you think you're right about something, but then you can just say, what am I missing? And by that doing that, you're creating such a better connection because you're inviting another perspective. Now, what so happens- it, just one minute, I just want to underline, it's, it's really something leaders need to learn and it's hard for them to learn because they are so trained- <laughs> in um, telling and not in asking questions. Uh, they are telling what's the right answer and they are also trained um, in, they are expected to have all the answers. So this is really a big step for them to learn. And therefore, I just want to underline the question, what am I missing? Really a crucial golden key <laughs> to vulnerability and more and more um, psychological safety. Yeah, thank you for underlining that. I, I want to highlight a little bit the danger when that doesn't happen. When the, you know, just as Caroline said, leaders are trained to have the answers, to be very definitive and, and not to ask those questions. What happens is that uh, we get into something called conformity bias. And conform conformity bias is very common. And it is that everyone in the room or in the virtual room feels pressure to agree with everybody else. And I will tell you, um, Simeon, you said, you know, um, Manette and Caroline, you seem very strong, like you speak up. I have been in professional situations where I did disagree with either the leader or with the prevailing uh, viewpoint in the room, but I didn't always feel that it was okay to speak up because I often felt like, ooh, are you going to take that risk? Are you going to be the one who disagrees with the eight other people in the room and our manager? Is it worth the risk? Maybe I'll just be quiet. Maybe I'll just go along with it. And Colleen, you just said yeah, I, 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 I really want to underline this as a biologist from a biologist perspective. Um, holding back and not taking risk is what our brain is kind of default. It's it's the brain's default. And what's the key, key purpose of our brain? It's not to be courageous, to come up with innovative ideas and so on, to try new things. No, the main purpose of our brain for millions of years was to keep us safe, yeah, to ensure our survival. And therefore, in every minute of our life, our brain tells us, is it or evaluates, is it risky or not? And if there's the slightest risk, our brain advises us <laughs> not to step into this risk. Exactly, thank you. Thank you for sharing the science behind it because you know a lot of people think, oh, you're just making this stuff up. No, this is our biology at work, right? Like this, this need to keep ourselves safe, that just, that dictates so much of our behavior and our interpersonal behavior. And so, you know, my instinct of like, it's not safe for me to speak up here. I'm just gonna remain silent. That was self-preservation. That was, you know, it was, I knew it was dangerous for me to speak up in certain situations. So it's so important for leaders to create these conditions where we're not having that biological reaction and instead we know our brains are calm this is a safe environment if I challenge I'm not going to get embarrassed I'm not going to get shut down and so when we say things like what am I missing and you do it regularly by the way if you do it just once it's not going to necessarily change the feeling but if you regularly every time you have a meeting every time you present your ideas you say what am i missing let's have some dialogue about this then you are setting the tone that you know you as the leader don't have all the answers and everyone has a valuable perspective to share and this is what we we really need to do and want to do yeah, and I, I just want to underline the crucial role, the vital role of the leader, because um, as you said, the leader needs to practice this regularly and the leader needs to know that um, this, the brains of all the team members are risk averse. And so he needs to overcome the structural um, advantage for silence. So the default is to not take risk. And as a leader, you want everyone to speak up, right? So you need to encourage everyone <laughs> to overcome the um, natural default um, risk averse option and go and, and take the risk and speak up and so on. And this is not the natural thing 
um, to happen. This is something which needs to be consciously cultivated as a leader. That's so, yeah, so crucial about the role of the leader. Right. I think, you know, that it's interesting because um, this this move that we're talking about here, asking what am I missing, it comes in our overall play of courageous, commu communicating courageously. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the leaders are the ones, I think, who really need to step into the courage of being vulnerable and asking what we don't know so that we are minimizing what our employees need to do in terms of courage. We don't want every question to be an exercise in huge courage, right? We want to just make it easier to ask the questions and not be weighing the risks, the danger, dare I ask. Instead, just say like, oh yeah, I don't, I, I don't understand this. Can you say more? Or I don't agree with it. And that that is a minimal risk as opposed to a huge risk. So, so really the managers, the leaders, anyone in a position of authority just plays such a big role. So Jeanette, I know, if yeah. If I could come in, I wanted to say that uh, you mentioned in the book that leaders are often averse to these kind of discussions because they're also decision makers and they want to make a decision and more conversation means that that decision is going to get delayed right but you say you can have it both ways yeah and it and of course leadership is such a balancing act all the time that yes you need to be decisive and you can't have things open for years without making a decision sometimes it you know months or is not acceptable either but I think that what we what we advocate is that you try to gather as much input as you can to solicit different ideas, process them all, synthesize them all, and then come up with the best solution. And it doesn't have to be weeks, months, years, um, but to not do that, you're certain to miss something. You're certain to miss something. So that's what we're trying to, um, you know, get leaders to understand is that it's not all or nothing. That there are compromises where you can solicit input and still make a timely decision. Yeah. So um, uh, maybe a quick question if anyone wants to chime in, because as Simeon said, we love we love input from attendees and participants. Does anyone do this regularly? Have you experience with, with either saying, what am I missing? Or having someone say that to you? And, and how does that work for you? Does anyone wanna chime in? Either in chat or unmute. Hi, Dr. Davis. I think he wants to say something is turning on his yeah. mic. He is actually a neurosurgeon. So he's uh, oh. not, not so far retired. From, from your retired. work. Retired. <laughs> It depends a lot on the background of the leader and how uh, he leads or she leads. If they're willing to listen to other opinions, I think it's great. But you can usually smell right in the beginning if the leader is going to be open to a discussion. And if there's no discussion, keep your mouth shut and wait for another time. <laughs> oh, that is By so the way, I, I do want to mention also uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Mrs. Minette Norman, I like your pussy willows to your oh, right. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank, you. <laughs> thank you. I have a little, a little something in the background to make it more interesting than a blank wall. Thank you, Dr. Davis. Well, well you know, well. yeah, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I'm fine. I was just going to say, since you're from the medical field, I don't know if you are familiar with uh, much of this research on psychological safety, but the original research that Dr. Amy Edmondson from Harvard did was done in the medical field. And what she uncovered was so fascinating because she found in her initial research that medical teams that had that reported more errors and failures like in the operating room or with patient medication they actually ultimately had better outcomes than teams that did not report many errors. And she thought her data was incorrect. She thought it had been reversed and she sent out a, a research assistant to go verify the data. And it turned out it was true. And what she was uncovering was that if we talk openly about errors, we will ultimately do better and learn from them. But it seemed counterintuitive. So to your point about, you know, whether you can challenge the leader in the medical field, it was often could, for example, a nurse challenge a doctor about an error that they saw. And if that doctor was not open to feedback, they would hold back and it could result in deaths and horrible outcomes. So that was where Absolutely. this original research was done. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Very so I'm thinking, true. Very yeah, true. you probably know this intimately from your work. 
I've been retired over 20 years now, 25 years. So, <laughs> Well, I'm sure you haven't forgotten. <laughs> oh, I try not to. I'm trying to learn new things, though, <laughs> but That's not great. in medicine. <laughs> Good. Well, so we're happy to have you here with us. That's wonderful. Um, I enjoy Sims programs here yeah, very much. Thanks, great. Dr. Davis. <clears throat> Shall we go to our next poll? Okay, so here's here's the statement here. When speaking with colleagues, I want to convince them of my perspective. How do you feel about that? Do you agree, neutral, strongly disagree? When speaking with colleagues, I want to convince them of my perspective. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Okay, 100% agree. Why, of course. We always wanna convince people of our perspectives, right? That's what we're here for. We're right, we know what we're talking about and we're gonna, we're gonna convince you. So we're gonna offer an alternative to that, which is that one of the most important qualities, especially in leaders and managers in trying create, to create psychological safety is to try to truly understand the person you're speaking with, to really listen with the intent to understand. And this sounds, of course, simple and obvious, but what we usually do when we think we are listening is that we're actually preparing our response. Because as we all said, we want people to you know, know what we have to say and we think we're right. So it's actually quite challenging when someone is speaking and you're listening to them to not prepare your rebuttal, to not prepare what you're going to say next, and instead to just listen. And you know, it may be that someone's going to talk a little long and you just have to sit with them and listen, or you think you understand them, but you really don't. So you need to ask a clarifying question. And it takes, honestly, it takes concentration. It takes patience. It takes curiosity to listen to someone, to understand, and to understand their perspective. Now, some people get a little concerned when we say this, like when we're doing workshops and things that if I truly listen to someone, it means I agree with them. Like I just, but you know, I have to take away my opinion and instead adopt their viewpoint. And, and you know, we wanna clarify that understanding someone's perspective does not mean agreeing. They are not, you know, one does not require the other. But it does require you to let go of your need to be right and maybe to consider another perspective and not just get into this battle of arguments, I'm right and you're wrong. It, it takes practice to really permit ourselves to fully understand someone, especially when we, we don't see eye to eye with them. But it's amazing how that can create the conditions for much more collaborative, much more uh, constructive relationships, and then be able to disagree and move forward, uh, reach you know, happy compromises, and, and really move forward in a way where everyone does feel that their voice matters and counts and is respected. Because when we don't do that, what can really happen is that Unfortunately, and especially when it's the manager or the leader in the group, if they're shooting down other people's ideas, especially people who report to them in the hierarchy, the person, you know, maybe once or twice will not be too upset, maybe, depending on their level of sensitivity. But if it happens time and time again that this leader says, like, they are just not interested in understanding other perspectives, people are going to stop offering them. And really, it's just going to be an echo chamber for whoever has the loudest, most powerful voice, and people will hold back their ideas. And, you know, this is where we lose out on new ideas, innovation. We may miss actually really big risks because we, in our biased mind, didn't see them. Someone else might have seen them, but we, we didn't really listen to understand what they were saying. So, Caroline, you want to add something there? I'm sure. Yeah, you mean it. Um, yeah, it's so um, so crucial. Listen to understand, and not listen to respond. I just wanted to underline this and loop it a little bit back to the poll question we started with. Um, we and 
And all the leaders we are working with are strong persons with strong opinions and they are convinced of their perspective and for sure they want to convince others of, of the perspective and they are convinced they are right. So what um, we see um, works out well for those leaders is to understand that it's kind of a three-step process. So kind of you, you need to put your strong perspective a little bit um, aside. And the first step is really to make sure you fully understand the other person. So step one, understand the other person. And then kind of um, as step two, then share your perspective. And you can make it as strong as possible. Yeah? And make sure that the other person can understand you fully as you did before. And then once the two persons have a complete understanding of the perspective of the other person, then ask the question, what's the best way forward? How do we put it together? However, we often skip one or two steps and jump directly to, to step um, three, what to do now. But really our advice two steps and then step three if I that's, what, break in. that's what we're that's what we're missing in the world today open mindfulness yes, yes. whether it be medicine or politics or interrelationships absolutely that is so true i was i was giving a talk recently about empathy it's all related and and uh, someone in the audience said um do you think that this very very polarized political climate we're in today is is really reducing our empathy for one another and i think you know there's some of that we are not listening we're not willing to hear this other perspective and it's so powerful when we do so yeah very absolutely. true very true absolutely yeah Dr. Davis, since you're unmuted, is there anything you want to add about, about how you've listened or what's challenging about listening or how maybe how you feel when someone's not listening to you? Why am I boring them? <laughs> <laughs> but it's very true. I've enjoyed everything you said, and I apologize for arriving 10 minutes late. But uh, you hit all the nails on the head. If people were more open-minded and willing to listen to others, other aspects of what is being said and, and integrate them with what they're thinking, we'd be uh, in a better situation, not only in medicine, but as I said a moment ago, in the world. In the world. Well, that's what we're trying to do is actually change the world for the better. So <laughs> happy well, to have you along. To hear Good luck. Good luck. Good luck. <laughs> I did. Maybe to elaborate a little bit on, on, on the power of listening, um, this is really, in whatever context you are, really a superpower. And I can, I can tell, um, I, I applied it in my private life too, and it really transformed my relationships. Yeah. And for me personally, it was such a big aha to understand, okay, understanding doesn't mean agreeing. So I can fully understand uh, my husband and that this doesn't mean I agree. And Good agreeing luck. agreeing doesn't mean liking. So disentangle understanding, agreeing, liking for me really <laughs> changed, changed my life completely. And I wanted to come in and say that another thing that I found so special in the book, uh, the part about listening, is that you write that instead of coming up with a response, you should be thinking about asking for further information to draw out what they're saying. And so that you go and you say, I understood this, is that correct? And then you continue and then you earn that person's trust because the person understands that person's listening to what I have to say and they appreciate it. And then you say, okay, I understand that, okay. Could you tell me more about that? Tell me more, I think, is the uh, is the catchphrase in the book. 
tell me more is a is a superpower phrase right exactly it's amazing what happens when you keep asking to hear more then people start to reveal more and you also are checking your own assumptions Caroline and I had this conversation yesterday about we assume people are understanding us we assume we're understanding others but if we ask clarifying questions we often realize we've misunderstood completely and now we are getting a clarification so so this is really important um, I'm conscious of time. I'm going to just do the quick mini dive into the last one. If we'll do our last poll. Okay. Failure is the opposite of success. How do you feel about that statement? Okay. Disagree, hundred percent disagree. Now that's so interesting because if you look up, if you look up failure and success, and you might see that they're antonyms. That on paper they seem to be, they seem to be opposite. And yet, uh, you probably know who those of you who answered is that there is no innovation, there are no breakthrough ideas without failures along the way. And certainly, Dr. Davis, coming from a medical background, you know this as well, that the breakthroughs in science, the breakthroughs in the world, the inventions did not happen with lots of failure along the way. But in the world of work, it is often quite rare to normalize the discussion of failures. And what happens instead is that we, we hide them. We're embarrassed by our failures. We don't think it's safe to share them, especially with our manager and with our peers. And so we go, we, they basically stay in the shadows. But what happens if we don't talk about failure as a regular thing? And I love this drawing that Caroline has done is that, yeah, there is no straight line to success. There's this ups and downs and twists and turns. And that's how we do make progress. If we don't talk about those twists and turns. We don't learn from them. And that arrow that Colleen just drew would be much, much longer because we would just completely, we would, com we would repeat those loops uh, and we would not make it to the success. So what we are trying to do is to get leaders to destigmatize failure in their organizations and make it something that we celebrate talking about. You know, we didn't, we just did something. It was an experiment. It was a little, little bit of a risk. This is what we learned. This is what we're going to try next. And to treat everything as much as an experiment as we can so that we learn quickly from failures. Because if we don't do that gradually, we'll just have a really big failure in the end and we didn't learn anything along the way. And so we, we really want leaders to start saying things like, just as we said, what have I missed? We're trying to get leaders to actually say things like, I expect failure uh, as we try new things, as we take new risks. Let's try these things. Let's not be afraid, but let's learn from them and let's share what we've learned. So that's the behavior change we're trying to drive. And, you know, I worked in the software industry for 30 years, and I will tell you, we didn't talk about failure enough. And we would have these bugs that would just keep reoccurring all the time because people didn't share openly. It wasn't safe to share openly. Now things have changed a bit because, you know, with software like, like Zoom, for example, this is cloud-based software. If it fails, it fails in a big way. We would all be kicked off this meeting right away. So what has changed and what is really helpful in the world of software is because things like Zoom need to be up 24-7, teams are actually having things that, that are called blameless postmortems. And we talk about that in the book. But the idea is that we, had, we just had an outage, right? Zoom had an outage. And so let's talk about what happened. What did we learn from it? What are we going to do differently? This can be applied in any business, in any situation. But the idea is really to talk about failure and learn from failure and not make it such a scary thing. Uh, Dr. Davis, I've, I'd love to ask, you know, having been in the medical field, how did you all talk about things that went badly? Did you? Let's see. Am I still muted or? No, you're good. We can hear you. Oh, good, good. Well, it would it would vary um, in where I was working at the time, depending on the people you're working with. And uh, uh, as I was coming up through internship and residency, it was pretty well an open discussion, and, and uh, the senior people 
were never upset if you come up with something that went wrong because they most of the time at least in my experience they really wanted to see what went wrong why it went wrong and try to solve it which is important but later on as we got out into uh, private practice and the uh, difficulties working at times with other people because they wanted control it was more difficult to say well i think you made a mistake and here's what i would have done mm -hmm. um, nobody likes to be corrected at least in my experience yeah, those are those are really important insights. And I think it, it's hard because it can seem embarrassing. It can seem like you're you're minimizing their professionalism and their abilities. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And instead, what we want to do is like we are, you know, we want especially I mean, these your situations are life or death. We want to minimize bad outcomes. And the only way we can do that is to learn from things that didn't go well. So, exactly. uh, yeah, you're not so right we're trying to. Yeah. I don't know who, no matter who you are, you're not, yeah. you don't have the correct answer every single time. That's right. That's right. So if you can hear me, uh, uh, I'll chime in. Our video is not working, unfortunately. Uh, I'll chime in with two thoughts. One, you know, it seems to me, and Caroline is a um, scientist, what you're describing is the scientific method, which is uh, building, really built on failure. That's one. But the other, that occurs to me, you know, particularly if you're in a position to assemble a team, does the leader have the courage to assemble a team of people who disagree? Um, so team arrivals, you know, Abraham Lincoln is the uh, iconic example, but it, it's easy to assemble a team of people who you know will agree with you. So you can listen to them all you want, but they're gonna, they're gonna, their ideas will mirror yours. And that doesn't really get you where, where it seems to me you're describing you wanna go. Thank you uh, so much. That is so true. Interesting <laughs> comment, Frederick. And I I'd love to dive into what um, does failure mean in science and for the scientific uh, method? Because um, this is really, really interesting um, question. And um, I mean, um, there's this idea that science scientists want to falsify hypotheses, right? And turns out, no, scientists are humans as well. They don't like their hypothesis being falsified. So I'm not sure if um, Bertrand Russell was <laughs> was getting it right. And for sure, um, um, Thomas S. Kuhn came up with an interesting insights about how science, science works in terms of the people doing science. Uh, and um, uh, Thomas S. Kuhn, um, the structure of scientific revolutions, so insightful. And how do you deal with failure? And um, yeah, for sure, we can't discuss and decide this <laughs> within uh, the remaining minutes. However, you really hit a very important point. And I always think um, it's so crucial to also disentangle something here, disentangle the learning value we get out of our failures, our experiments in science, in business, wherever, in innovation, from blaming, from feeling bad about it. Yeah? And if we can separate this and maybe even make people feel good because they took the risk and did something new and innovated and maybe did an intelligent failure, which um, um, gave a lot of um, learning value, that, that, that would be great. Well said. <laughs> I mean, I know we're getting getting close on time. Do you want us to do a little wrap up here? Or how do you want to? Sure. Yeah, I wanted to say also that what what struck me that was so important. One of the main takeaways from the book is that we all have a problem with saying uh, with with emotions. Emotions are the the kind of the first reaction we have to any kind of commentary, whether it be uh, we're elated, we feel happy because someone praised us, or we feel awful because someone criticized us, and that we really have to get rid of that, and we have to kind of take into consideration that that's we're, no matter what we're going to feel something, and so a, a great um, method the book teaches is that you say, well, that really makes me feel angry. You said that to me, <laughs> or that makes me feel good, or that makes me feel bad. 
and that that in itself is diffusing, it's neutralizing the emotion, and then you can have you know a, a, a normal talk after that, and then you can get because you get your own feelings, you get yourself out of the way. Is that right? Well, you know, I, I think that it's you, you've definitely touched on something so important, which is that often we think that emotions are a bad thing when emotions are just part, again, of, of who we are as humans. And so not to try to pretend we don't have them, which is what happens a lot is like, I'm a leader, I must not be emotional, but instead to be very self-aware of like, I'm a leader and I'm getting really defensive right now, or I'm a leader and I'm mad because you didn't do what I asked you to. And instead to just like, okay, I'm experiencing anger. I'm experiencing frustration. How am I going to react? And that it's how we react is what really makes or breaks the situation of psychological safety. And so it's it's critically important to tune into the emotions and not to pretend they're not there. So yeah, that is a that is a big part of our book as well. Fantastic. Yeah, so, maybe it's a little bit like yeah, it's a little bit like driving a car and you have a cockpit full of instruments and um, signals. And take your emotions as signals. Important to see them and they have meaning they they have an important message but you don't need to identify ask yourself what does it mean that i'm getting angry what is so you um get a little bit a more um spacious relationship towards your own emotions and you gain more freedom of choice more freedom um of um deliberate action right so uh, last question for you two, then uh, will you please come back and do another workshop? <laughs> we would love to. This is just, yeah, I feel sure. like we just scratch the surface and, and uh, we could go, we could do this for days. Absolutely. And, well, um, yeah. That, yeah, I'm deli yeah. delightful then. Delightful. Let's see how we can stay in touch then how we can, first of all, we can get the book. Here it is again, Psychological Safety Playbook. I believe it is now it is, it is ready to be published this month? No, not till February. 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 Okay, yeah. February. And so I will put that right there in the chat room for everybody. And then let's see how we can stay in touch with Minette. Here's her website, minettenorman.com. So feel free to reach out to her. And also to Caroline, carolinehelbig.com. There we are. So feel feel free to reach out to both of them with your questions or comments. Thank you so very much to Minette and Caroline. Thank you, Simeon. It was really you. a pleasure to be here. So let's take a Thank look you. at Thank you. Take a look at what we have next coming up next week. Amelie Kreiter. Who needs intercultural business training? In many parts of our world, everyone wears jeans, sends the same emojis and spends way too much time staring at smartphones. Today, globalization makes it seem that the world is coalescing around a single cultural perspective and that those who don't share that perspective simply haven't caught up. Yet a prost in Munich is still distinguishable from a toast in the city of London. And if those honest celebrations of companionship are still that different among European capitals, imagine how much different such rituals are in Dakar or Manaus. As tourists, we can marvel at such cultural distinctions and laugh at the misunderstandings that come from making jokes with people who don't get them. But it's a different game when you are dispatched to foreign lands as corporate ambassadors. Intercultural training becomes key to interacting successfully with your foreign counterparts. That's why Amelie Kreiter is called on to prepare businessmen and women for their upcoming assignments. Amelie a specialist in intercultural business, speaks six, that's six languages, and gained her insight into spoken and unspoken cultural differences as an employee of the global airline Lufthansa. During her master's in intercultural studies, she connected her international experience with key theoretical concepts of managing a global workforce, which led her to her calling as intercultural trainer and consultant. Come welcome Amelie to our show, and see for yourself how intercultural training is the difference between contract or no contract in today's global business world. As always, all information about upcoming shows may be found at www.simeonmorrow.com. A programming note to our viewers in North America, because of daylight savings time, 
Next week's show will take place one hour later at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, 1 p.m. Central Time, and 11 a.m. Pacific Time. Again, that's next week. Amelie Kreiter, who needs intercultural business training? Once again, thank you so very much to Minette Norman, to Minette and Caroline. Thank you very much to Agnieszka and, and Benoit Rivole for their support of this show. Most of all, thanks to you, our participants who make it all worthwhile. From Bonn, Germany, New London, New Hampshire, and the Bay Area, California, thank you very much and see you next Wednesday. Thank you, bye-bye.